And ladies and gentlemen, moving ahead with our first panel discussion for the day, this is going to be an interesting discussion on three P's of communication, pandemic perseverance and PR, how communication plays a pivotal role in crisis. Now, ladies and gentlemen, join me as we welcome our session chair for the panel discussion, Tarunjit Ratan, founder PRPOI. I would request Tarunjit to kindly take over the charge. A very warm welcome to you. Hey, hi, Kathy. Thank you. Hi. Thank you so much. A very warm welcome, firstly. Thank you. Good to see you in the morning. <laughs> very warm welcome to all our panelists. Okay, so welcome. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this E4M panel discussion, and it's the first one of the day. Uh, and in this panel, we have explore the PR storyline across the pandemic and draw a line of continuation to the Indian PR industry's performance. As it is often said, a good crisis is an opportunity for a PR team to towards success. Can I request everybody who is not on uh, my mute? I think it will be much easier. There's a lot of background noise. Excellent. And when somebody wants to, you know, kind of contribute to an answer or is answering, please switch it on. Yeah. It'll be easier for all our audiences to listen to. So if I may, you know, restate, it's often said in PR that a good crisis is an opportunity for a PR team to prove its perseverance and move towards success. But how has our PR industry fared in this crisis? Did it embrace the three P's of communication, pandemic, perseverance, and PR? And why, what and how did they showcase and enhance the value of this trust currency? To discuss this today on our E4M panel at the 11th edition of IPRCCA conference, we have with us an illustrious, illustrious panel who will share their views with us today. Let me introduce our panel who all come with vast experience across different sectors and have been weathered by many a crisis. I did get a chance to meet a few of them at the awards yesterday, and I'm hoping that they will be able to share a lot of their experience in our discussion today. So today we have with us Deepshika Dharamraj, CEO of Genesis BCW, Dilip Yadav, founding partner, first partners, Udit Patak, director of Media Mantra, Deepak Jolly, founder and director of Consortia Advisory, Aman Gupta, co-founder and managing director, SPAG Asia, along with Raji Chibber, the vice president, external affairs of Sahajnand Medical Technologies Private Limited. So let's start with Shikha. Shikha, could you share with us how crisis management, key pillar in PR, transforms a team's position at the brand table? You know, crisis has always been critical in any PR professional's life. In the last 26 plus years that I've been in PR, it was interesting. Uh, PR people are most remembered when a crisis happens in an organization. <laughs> and I, I still remember the early days, right? You know how it is that, oh, otherwise I don't want PR and we're all good and everything is working and humming along. But God forbid a crisis happens, that's when you go running saying, I need a good PR agency. So the role of PR in crisis, I think, is undeniable. Um, the good news is that today we have matured as PR professionals and having faced so many crises and for our clients mm -hmm. over the years, we today know and understand what it takes to provide the right kind mm -hmm. of counsel and advice. And I think that's what every PR professional aims to do is we should be sitting at the board table at that time to be able to give the right counsel and advice. And the second thing, which I think is important, is look holistically at all the stakeholders who are affected by that issue or crisis. It's never going to be the most obvious consumer or customer, but there are a whole lot of other stakeholders. So I believe PR professionals really did live up to their ask during this crisis because there was not just one client in crisis, which is normally the case, one or two. This time we had probably all clients in crisis at the same time. So it was a tough task. And I think uh, the industry was it did well in this time. Absolutely. Uh, Aman, would you want to add to that? Sure. I think you know, Deep Shikha sort of definitely covered in terms of the, the role of the PR firms in the crisis. But what I want to sort of add to that is that while 
we as a PR communicators understand the role. I think there is still a long way from the client side to understand that don't, it's not just about when the crisis hits you when you need us. I think the important part is that this is a kind of an ongoing exercise, you know, how you really build a risk insurance within the system so that when the crisis happens, you're able to mitigate it at a very, very early stage. You don't need to really, you know, reach the level where it starts to hurt the brand, it starts to hurt the operations. And I think that is something which during this pandemic, clients started to realize. And I think that is how a more investment has started to happen. And which is not just in terms of having PR firms on the board, but also to build internal systems so that you could have an early warning systems of how a crisis is coming in and can I really reduce something at a very, very early stage. And it's something where the top leadership is getting more involved into. So I think that's something which we could, which we have seen happening in the last say couple of quarters of the pandemic. Absolutely. So, you know, um, Chika mentioned a very interesting point that it's not just one client who was in crisis in the last couple of uh, quarters. I think it was every client who was on fire. And if I were to add one more P to the three P's that we are discussing, it would be people, right? Because uh, I believe it's people on both ends that need to be managed to be able to uh, handle a crisis. So, uh, uh, Udit, this question is for you. Can you help us understand how you managed people during this crisis? So, uh, uh, you know, Taranjit, what we did as an organization and as a firm was give power, more power to people, right? And since we work with a very lean segment in startups, our people were very aggressive as well, right? Uh, so we gave more power to them. And, you know, I was amazed at the level of maturity these guys showed during the time of crisis, and they are showing it right now as well. Uh, and the innovation which we were sending to different titles as to the, to the client side, you know, I was actually amazed. So, you know, uh, when we gave more power, we realized that, you know, people have a lot of potential. And, and uh, I'm talking about my internal, uh, my organization, right? Uh, and we built a lot of leaders during these time, this time. You know, uh, well, we, were, we, we now sit for it soon, but we have already identified at least five to seven new leaders in the organization long way to go with us so i think uh, we we this this crisis gave us an opportunity right uh, this was an event of a such big magnitude right uh, so what we realized was that okay we need to create you know build leaders and we need to make sure that it's an opportunity for us as an organization and that's that here we are you know we have already identified our people and i think um, you know uh, this was good for us you know in, in a way uh, because we realized the potential as well Absolutely. So we can look forward to a lot of interesting leaders coming from your organization. And I'm sure you're going to get a lot of promotions this year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, were you also equally surprised uh, at, you know, a, a kind of understanding from the client side as well? Dilip? So, oh, okay. Uh, okay. You know, so uh, I would say that, uh, yes, uh, there was a lot of, uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, fast action that a lot of clients took. And so not just kind of managing them from the crisis, but some of the clients were responding extremely fast to the whole thing. And that was only a reflection of how prepared they were. And we were supposed to kind of manage that. And that is exactly what we were able to do. You know, I also want to uh, make another point, which is that like you spoke about the opportunity part, and this is what we saw with many big brands as well. Uh, every crisis will bring uh, an opportunity along with it. If we look at the historical perspective, Disasters and wars have been the biggest grounds for sharp recoveries, for a lot of innovation, and uh, for a lot of reconstruction. And we did see right. that coming from many of our organizations. So if we go back, for example, you know, post-war, World War, Italy had, uh, uh, you know, uh, products, new product line of products coming out, which we never anticipated. People thought that it would be the era of uh, uh, you know more economical cars but we saw a lot of luxury cars like 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 the maserati and lamborghini and all of that coming out from that era right. so uh, so you know so a crisis will also bring its own set of post crisis opportunities which i think the organizations with a vision would be focused on and as a as a communication partner you have to be uh, you know going along with that vision and just man managing the immediate, but also preparing for the future. 
Absolutely. And I think we've seen a lot of innovation coming from, you know, our clients as well in terms of how to handle the crisis and move on. Rajiv, I would like to direct the next question to you. What is the best strategic approach that you have adopted to handle a crisis in the last year? Well, hi, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> so, uh, actually, uh, are you uh, did you my order? Uh, yeah. Thank you. Rajiv, do it. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, I directly come from the healthcare sector and that was the sector which was like uh, focused at that point of time. And, you know, comms emerged as the front runner to the fight against COVID. In fact, I would really want to tell you that the day the government started the lockdown, the day they were, uh, you know, interactions happening, the first thing which I got as a message from the Department of Pharmaceuticals, the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, uh, since we were into uh, you know medical devices and at that point of time there was a dearth of medical devices kits masks nothing was there in india which was being produced and they had to really you know uh, raise that industry the other part was the a whole uh, you know hospitals which were now going to be overburdened and the entire health landscape which had to be relooked by the government so buying time was something which the government wanted and at that point of time uh, all these ministries, including the Prime Minister's office, reached out to us and they said that we want to maintain an FIR and we were like all looking at each other, what's an FIR? And they said in a time of crisis, what we call this is the first information and response mechanism team, which is going to be made. So I was fortunate that, you know, well, I was a part of the entire kitchen cabinet with the Department of Pharmaceuticals, with the Ministry of Health, with the uh, minister, uh, industry and trade uh, uh, ministry, etc., to really lo look at that. But then, uh, you know, it was largely to demystify any rumors, any misinformation at that point of time. It was largely to also look at the role of a of a comms person from a corporate affairs perspective also. And that time, you know, we understood the role of really working with the government, really working as a corporate affairs professional, not to only position our companies in that sense, but also work towards a, uh, as a domestic company and Atma Nirbhar Bharat, which was the clarion call made later. So, uh, you know, I feel there was an immense task which was cut out the way uh, you know everything was managed and everything was really shared on a common platform and uh, what udit said or what dilip said and uh, aman dipshika said people was first then came the policies then came the uh, you know entire uh, programmatic value of uh, spreading out communications so this was this was a real eye opener at that point of time and i'm still i mean we're still working and grappling with it it's not that the pandemic is over now we have a new challenge of uh, demystifying the entire uh, you know uh, the, the covid shots um, i take pride in <laughs> calling that i'm the first private copcoms person who's got the uh, you know shot the first time but uh, yeah, wow. both, both, both cleared from my side got both the shots uh, but yeah i mean uh, it's it's still a long journey i i i mean the the normalcy will really touch by the quarter <laughs> Oh. Uh, Tarun, I think I just want to sort of add to uh -huh. what talk, Rajiv's talked about. I think one of the things mm -hmm. which has emerged, and you know, we were fortunate to work with WHO during the whole pandemic, was one of the key things we talked. Rajiv talked about was the misinformation, the rumors which were floating around. Because right. more than anything else, there was this whole conversation happening in social media space, and not just talking about India. We were working with WHO for a whole. Southeast Asia and one of the biggest challenge was that how do you really sort of you know tackle that thing almost on a real-time basis and one of the new sciences which has emerged from there is called infodemiology so WHO has come out with a new department altogether which is looking at how you look at information as it's floating in social media and how do you manage humors and misinformation a new department has been created and we were fortunate to develop this whole ecosystem uh, you know, with WHO and how you sort of do it almost in real time across multiple languages and ensure that we are able to mitigate any crisis emerging from this kind of a rumors, which could have a multiple impact, not just from a virus, but 
the information related to the virus per se. Brilliant. That's really brilliant. So, you know, this is an open question to the, all the panelists. While there have been a lot of innovation that has happened on the client as, as well to handle a crisis, and I think the PR industry as a whole has upped their entire ante on how they would like to handle a crisis. I want to understand from the panel if there is any new innovation that has happened on an agency end, right? Uh, apart from what we typically do to handle a crisis, what is it that you have personally looked at innovating? Deepa. Yeah, so, you know, I think uh, this was a time. Dilip, can you put on mute, please? Uh, thank you. So, you know, this is a time when you had to reorient and rethink about, as the panelists have said, about people. People in your agency hmm. needed to be first given insurance, guys. Uh, we are with you and we are going to operate in a complete different paradigm shift. Right. That's the first. Hmm. I think the second one was, for me, who was a bit tech uh, challenged. How do I use technology in my system quickly? I mean, right. so, uh, you know, how do you get to Zoom, Microsoft, WebEx, you name it, and use the best uh, telecom equipment, use the best broadband, and make sure that everybody in my 30 member team are well networked and well intentioned? I think right. that was the first challenge. That was the first big challenge. Right. The second was that if you have to, you know, reorient yourself, then you have to reorient your customer as well. Right. And many of the customers and the clients hmm. uh, said, people, no more brand promotion, no more this, no more that, no more events. So you went into a completely, uh, you shifted the gear and you had to tell the client, it's not about your crisis. It's a national crisis. It's a global right. crisis. And the narrative has to fit in into the global right. crisis, then the India crisis, then your city crisis. So, you know, so you have Affected. to. You have to, yeah, basically. So, the, and that, so I'm glad that at least 12 new clients came to me in pandemic. And that they said, Deepak. Uh, my codes are stuck. Can you help me to move? It was a lighting client, and I right. uh, he wrote all the narratives to the government. Went to the government, wrote the letters, got the clearances done. The movements of the goods happened. Second, uh, the industry was shut down. Everything was shut down. Hotels right. were shut. Malls were shut. Multiplexes were shut. Uh, entertainment center. How do you open that? Mm. I think the biggest thing where well, my adrenaline rush happens when a crisis happens, and I said, in your narrative, it is all about SOPs for your sector. Mm. People didn't believe it in the beginning when I said, uh, You will, we will write your narrative, we will make films, we will make sure that we are responsible, safe and making sure that when we open, we will adhere. And right. if we right. don't adhere, shut us down. Yeah. And I'm so glad that on June 8th, as a shopping center association, we were able to open all the shops. So we got a central notification. And then it was, we had to uh, escalate or de-escalate it to the state level. So I wrote 2,700 letters to different stakeholders. It's wonderful. You know, while uh, Deepak is talking about some of this, I think what's important is to also understand the innovations in our sector. I think, you know, uh, and everything is very, very critical as Deepak has pointed out. But I think the biggest area of difference, one was our adoption of digital. And it's not just meeting platforms, but I think it was understanding social media and being able to listen into sentiment and then being able to respond appropriately to that. So data and analytics was a big one. I think a lot of us were sort of slowly creeping along that journey of trying to figure out how data analytics works in our business. But the last right. year forced us to do it really quickly. And I think 
uh, the most innovative part is how are we then able to use that data and analytics and which brings me to the second big thing that happened as a trend was the idea of purpose saying very clearly that do you have a core purpose at the thought of your campaign at the heart of your strategy because gone are the days when you just you know do nice lip service and say okay buy my product because of benefits a b c d uh, the pandemic really did teach us that it has to be purpose-led creativity if you're going to survive this and if you're going to thrive in a future growth mindset you have to think through your not just your communication but even your business strategies and i think that was another big trend and innovation that we saw so for me these two are the big ones of using digital data and analytics to the benefit of communication and the second one was getting purpose-led creativity going for our organizations also, so you know, uh, Chikar, I would like to add here one more point. Uh, one point here, you know, you had to think about loss of lives and yeah. uh, unemployment much more than uh, you know that your business is earlier. Yeah, the business, you know, because what used to happen was when you are in a crisis, you talk start talking about your mounting losses. Your mounting losses narrative will not work in pandemic. You have to come out with, you know, yeah. positive, yes. future looking, growth future oriented. Absolutely. 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 And that, yeah. that narrative helped in opening up the economy. Absolutely. And that narrative like helped to... our, our bureaucrats, our government. And I must say, they were very helpful. And they used to say, how people can we create a win-win? How can we make sure the sector is broken? And that was a very, very helpful way. Of course, yeah, I think PM Modi is already talk, talking about how like the private that. sector has such a strong role to play in the revival of an of our economy now. Where we're talking of this V-shaped recovery, and just in his speech, uh, I think day before he was talking about how don't look to the government only for all the solutions. The private sector has so many solutions, and I think we all know from our work that we are doing. And the government also recognizes that that it has to be a joint effort often led possibly by the private sector and then supported adequately by the government by doing the right things you know as communicators Absolutely. the biggest contribution that as communicators that we make is through the intellectual contribution and it's not that we come with huge processes we need a tremendous amount of technology and all of that to really do a good job at what we do so I think the biggest innovation that I start I saw and we kind of uh, were kind of pushing it at our end as well was the way we kind of you know uh, intellectually kind of reorient the communication piece with our clients because a lot of activities were shut down and I think right. trust was uh, there were a lot of rumors like what Amit Aman pointed out and uh, trust was something which was missing I think the most so it was important that there was a need for you know communication coming from credible sources. So just to getting, for example, just and I'm giving this as one of the examples. There were many things. Uh, getting the company's leaders to become the source of communication and getting them to maybe over communicate a little bit, and sometimes with you know kid background kind of videos and uh, calls, and to, to kind of you know shed the that uh, corporate cloak of uh, you know trying to do it very in a, in a very prim and proper manner, but to do more human kind of communication was very innovative. And that is something that I think that conversation you know, leadership a lot. communication. I think leadership communication has kind of taken prominence over every kind of other vertical that we would earlier talk about. I think uh, yeah. leaders leaders now have to get comfortable being the face of the company, whether they like it or not. You know, having said that, uh, policy making is also essential point i mean this question is directed to you you've been speaking a lot about policy making government advocacy and brand crisis communication how intricately are they linked and at what point does a pr team need to activate it well i think one thing which we have seen in the pandemic happening is that it's now become a more of a multi-stakeholder approach so the government right. and i think Deepak talked about the fact that the government and its role during the pandemic was very important uh, for example, and you know, uh, as a healthcare person, one of the big things was how do you ensure supply chain of pharmaceuticals, drugs, and not just in India, 
but globally as we realized that indian pharma industry rose to the occasion and became mm. the supplier across the world and despite mm. the fact that it was a lockdown everything moved and the reason why it moved was because there was a complete cohesiveness between mm. industry and the policy makers and how do you ensure mm. that communication is that thread which is able to connect all of these stakeholders to ensure that the right communication is going out it's the right positivity which is coming out and you are able to trickle down this messaging to all different stakeholders not just from a central to the state to the people at a district level because you need to sort of you know work with stakeholders which are multiple layered and everybody is trying to ensure things sort of you know moves and that is where the role of a communicator to ensure that he's able to connect all these dots became right. a very very important aspect so another point uh, among great point i would just like to add here one of the things when you communicate during a crisis you have to be very short and precise right and you have to in case you are are you are asking the stakeholders then what is the answer if you are communicating you are in trouble then what is the top two points don't in, in because people don't have the time to listen to you. Uh, cri crisis come let me tell you crisis doesn't knock on your door and come uh, crisis happens and this happens so what is and people half the people panic and in panic right. they do wrong things and speak wrong things the first and foremost is make sure during a crisis guys hold your horses so that's why we need to pre-train our people who handle crisis that's the other big thing right and we all as pr professionals do what is called the crisis preparedness so in the Absolutely. earlier days you remember deepak when you used to tell a managing director or chairman that you know we need to pre-train you for a crisis and they'd be like no 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 don't say crisis word if you say it it'll happen and i don't yeah. want this <laughs> today you remember those days they said superstitiously crisis mat bolo is border and, 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 I think, and Deepak, i think adding to the thing the complexity yeah. of the social media nowadays see if i we just look at from the last you know all of us has been in the industry for more than 20 years you know earlier it was much more simple the fact that the yeah, social media it and as it happens media. In, it's this in real time and the leadership is exposed to that you know what do you say yeah. you know if you're not saying Absolutely. that's also not right if you have to say mm -hmm. you have to say the right thing build up on the purpose what you talked about uh, earlier also trust authenticity as exactly. the other big one yeah because you know, exactly. in a crisis if you speak uh, and try to spin it you could actually be in bigger it, trouble. It has to. It 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 it, it has to be genuine. It has to be genuine. Yeah. It has to be authentic, and it should be something which follows from an action, not just the talk. You have to mm. act, and then showcase you've been able to make a difference in the lives of the people. Absolutely. So, Tarun, I I would want to. Yeah, I wanted to add a very important thing. So uh, while uh, there was this entire cabinet which was formed with the Prime Minister's office, the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. And WHO and uh, uh, you know Department of Pharmaceuticals created an eagle's nest. At the eagle's nest, the one way to look at COVID, which is C O V I D, which was dispelled, which was actually told to us that use this acronym when you are doing communication was clear communication for opportunity, voice first, identify relevance and information. Dispel and display solidarity. So this was C O V I D, and it it was actually you know we call that uh, you know that center the eagle's nest. That's where we. I'm held. curious and why they call it eagle's nest. Eagle's nest was Hitler's special place of getaway uh, during World well, War. Yeah, you know, when, when eagle's the nest is the place. Nest. Where we get into no, no, no. Uh, it, it was a warfare. It was a warfare acronym. Actually, you know, this was warfare. Yeah. This was World genuine. War information warfare which was being handled at the government's level with with every stakeholder in mind so i think uh, the the p's which we are talking about the three p's or you know we can talk about five p's that that completely covered the entire covid uh, pandemic and we were all i mean i was fortunate i learned a lot i mean well, we've all gone through crisis we've all been uh, crisis communications uh, experts at one time or the other but 
over a decade or over multiple decades this kind of crisis comes and we are we were fortunate to ride the tide today so, we are going so to is, now you know i, I think that's so right uh, one thing we have one thing yes sorry sir <laughs> I was saying that you know it was more the focus on the facts rather than the perspectives, which becomes important in a crisis situation. So right. uh, you know, for example, a simple innovation done by a student at John Hopkins University, which actually became then the global source for people to track what's going on and where in pandemic, became uh, you know people were tracking uh, John Hopkins uh, site and information more than the government of India source because they trusted it more. And even WHO, because that trust was more. Sorry, uh, Avan. <laughs> uh, you know, but uh, so this was a simple example of uh, what was the focus. The focus was on facts. If you can stay close to the facts, be very brief, like Deepak uh, rightly said, keep it very short and stay factual. People will follow, and that is, I think, an opportunity window for you to then, then kind of bring in concern, then can bring in perspective. What you call the cap concern, uh, action perspective. Absolutely. I'll just like to add one more point because two lessons which you need to learn in a crisis. One, you need to have a war room. Huh? As right. Ajib said, the, the war room concept is not understood by many and hmm. they fail and then the crisis keeps multiplying. So one is the war room. The second most important is the crisis management team. Who in the crisis management team will do what? Not more than six to seven members. And those six to seven members will then lead to uh, whether it is people, what is to be said outside, what is to be said to everyone. That role has to be identified very quickly. And, Absolutely. And that, you know, these two are very cardinal principles of crisis i have written many manuals for multinationals on crisis yeah. management but yeah. these two come very handy whether it's a pandemic or it is a crisis of a city or a, a company just wanted to add absolutely so, so you, I, I, you have I, been talking I, about uh, uh, policy making as well add, uh, uh, yeah just to add this question we have been nice. talking uh, about, oh, sorry I'm actually not able to hear a lot of people because of some internet issues. Uh, but still, one thing which I would like to add, you know, while we've been talking about crisis uh, at the client side, we need to talk about that we were also in crisis, right? As 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 leaders, as entrepreneurs, we've been leading firms. We all were into a crisis. So how did we manage the crisis was also a learning because nobody knew uh, about the pandemic. Nobody knew what will be the next steps which we will take, right? So I think as 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 an industry together. Uh, you know, well, we we all spoke with each other on a regular basis. I think we we have done really well. You know, we have handled uh, you know this crisis far far maturely than other industries have handled. Uh, you know, and we have connected as an industry a lot together uh, these days. So I think uh, that's important for us uh, to also talk, right? Uh, so there is one as one one learning which completely failed during this crisis so you know all our lives and in the last 25 years have been constantly drilled this thing that preparedness is the answer to handling crisis and this pandemic i think demonstrated very well the best of the minds in the world the best of the governments in the world were not prepared nobody was prepared and and whatever preparation they had failed completely so what do you really do so i think what yeah. really and what we clearly saw it was also the duration of opportunities so while a lot of businesses were going down, there were businesses which were acquiring. And the biggest of the deals in the country were happening. You know, the Facebook right. deal with Alliance and all of that. So we also saw that uh, businesses which were more than not just prepared, but I think they went, went beyond preparation to play safe from the very go. So the over leveraged <laughs> business models, the high risk business models were, uh, you know, uh, kind of they failed completely. They crashed immediately. So I think mm -hmm. there is some sense in Indian frugal approach of uh, you know following the basics and uh, being careful and that's this is even beyond being prepared you could be prepared Absolutely. but if you have an average model then your preparation can go for a toss because something unforeseen is happening you can only prepare for what you can anticipate but there is something yeah. where you're going to prepare for something which you can never anticipate and that is easy yeah. 
this was so like yeah, a... I'm taking the question back if i'm taking the question back to the policy making part of it um, the, I'm, i'm very intrigued by you guys spoke about it uh, i want to understand from you know you uh, how much of it does in in policy making how much of a part does pr play now because i believe it has expanded as scope of work has expanded to take part in all these larger discussions as well earlier it was a specialized team like deepak or maybe a couple of verticals that we would say are hamara kaam nahi hai this is government wala work right but now i think every team is being asked to be a part of it so how so, much of uh, has increased for the pr guys rajiv i would like yeah. you to answer first and then deepak yeah, to yeah. Okay, so yeah, so there is a theoretical and a practical part, but I think I can speak on the deeper. Okay. Yeah. So, I, so, I think. Uh, so the, okay, let okay. me let me then finish. So there is a theoretical part. So theoretically, you know, we are in a democracy, and we are about discussions. You know, democracies are about discussions, and there is there are windows which are created by the government for discussions to come in, for viewpoints to come in. But I think we also live in an environment which where this is a Uh, we live in a democracy of verdicts where a verdict is announced that the pand- the lockdown has started now you know and there is no room for discussion there is no scope for anything so i think the policy environment is also changing so while discussion would be very relevant but we also need to understand and recognize that there are verdicts which are uh, and which is really the practical part of it so how do you deal with these verdicts so i think uh, i heard that uh, there was uh, least amount of uh, feedback or you know counter views on the current budget that was also because this is this is the, the times of the verdicts so in an environment like this i think the policy making process and the communications role in shaping that also has to become very i would say underneath you cannot make visible communication you have to go a little invisible you have to go direct and so i think the whole uh, landscape has changed from a very direct sorry indirect communication using a lot of uh, media power to communicate to more direct communication coming from the right people with right reasons with right logic which intelligent people can understand so i think that's a major change that i see if no, your views don't you think don't you think that you know the pr guys have earned a seat at the table and the reputation of the reputation industry has been enhanced from last year it does not need to be indirect routes any more i think it's going with the line to be able to make this policy decisions your take on it you know let's look at the it industry for example right you know there are there are examples of the it industry that they will work from home till the end of this year and maybe in future the it industry may work from home uh, now these are norms which will change the way of working and we will have to live so you will have to uh, you know try to work on these points in the future technology will have to be adopted uh, of course uh, you can always say i have my sympathy for the sectors like tourism and hospitality but the fact is for next two years this sector is going to be very very badly impacted so we are helping as consultants we are trying to see what are the new things what are the innovations uh, how do we make sure that these this industry survives and one interesting point i would just like to add you know for hotel association of india we try to uh, look show, make sure that if they are losing jobs can we get their jobs into some some other areas and nokri.com came forward and said we will help them to provide the jobs uh, and put the biodata in a manner this was this was across india and and, they, and this is where the cross pollination of industries will start working and working towards the benefit pandemic is still here it's not gone and absolutely we are we are in a yo yo it is yeah. looking it's going down but like many western countries which was is going down completely you can have a spike again so we have to be well prepared for any kind of issue that may happen in the future uh, people will पब्लिक पर्पज 
Now that was really crystal clear. What you think over, whatever you look at it, it's for public purpose. So I think that was where the rule ratified into public policy. So uh, we have a couple, you know, I'm hoping we have five more minutes left. So I'm going to uh, ask you quick questions. I want each one of you to respond for a minute. Yeah, uh, you know, all of this reminds me of the which I handled almost 20 years ago, and it pretty much hit you like a truck. I would be remiss if I did not ask this. Can't hear about... you properly, Talent. Can everybody go on to mute, please? Yeah. Yeah. Dilip. Now, better? Awesome, awesome. So um, I would be remiss if I did not ask this panel about their first PR crisis case. What was it like? If I can have a quick answer from everyone, though I, I know it's very difficult, but uh, let's start with Amal. OK, first crisis being in healthcare, yeah. it was uh, yeah. an issue. Uh, it was an issue which was with one of, I can't name the client, uh, but one of the leading hospital chains in India at that time. And you had uh, a kind of a death of uh, a politician which happened at the hospital. And therefore, the there was a huge backlash about, uh, you know, the, the conduct of the hospital or the conduct of the, the doctors. And uh, it was something which I would say I have still not seen it in that kind of a crisis because you... The client was in the media almost on a daily basis. Almost every possible journalist lashed out about how inhuman the whole thing was. And it took us about a month to get that whole situation back into control. But we really used the science communication as a way to sort of explain that how uh, what the hospital did was medically the, the best way to be done. Of course, it's not uh, an exact science. It's an, there are things which are unknown still in the medical science part of it. But they did what was the right thing to be done. And it's something which globally is accepted. So, But after that, that client was with us for almost 10 years. And we did what Deepak talked about, you know, prepared them for the future crisis. And after that, they did not have that kind of a crisis. Few minors happened, but uh, they, they learned the lesson that it needs to be a part of the system now. Absolutely, Shika. My, my first crisis. One by one. Uh, Deepak, I, I, yeah, yeah. I can tell you this, and uh, Deepak will probably remember this. Um, that's when I think we first met. So it was a multinational fast food business which had come into India. I think I was barely two years into the working uh, life of mine. And uh, there were a whole lot of NGO and activists and animal rights uh, who were objecting for. With, because of the entry of this MNC into the country, and they were actually going to spread across the country. They had great plans. It was a very well known and respected business around the world. And I still right. remember uh, we started working on it, and we said, okay, and the activism and all that, we'll handle it. We, we had the statements, we had the points of view, and all that we were doing. We opened our first store, and we what we were not ready for was a huge crowd of farmers who appeared and there was stone throwing and pelting and the whole wow. storefront crashed and broke and i still remember i was inside that store with the chief marketing officer and the head of the business standing next to me and we were like completely gobsmacked like, now what and of course there were the television channels and everybody i don't think we ever you know we acted really fast and it was just pure gut reaction at that time i mean nothing in the world could prepare you for you know you're standing inside the store inaugurating and the whole thing crashes out and then of course there were various things like the police should have been there for security for protection i mean you, you go through all those but those are post evaluation and i think what i learned that day was that exactly this you can work out various scenarios but what will be required is what is your instant gut reaction which is your training which is your experience which is uh, how do you manage what's happening right there and then and I, I think that lesson i've used always of what the first initial you know that intuition that comes to you and then of course you back it up with all the right rational logic or all that as you go along so yeah absolutely absolutely thank you for sharing so that my before. first question i still was yeah, my sorry if I can because I have something related to what Deepshika has said. So mine was a learning from this. So we I was handling the McDonald's entry into India and what she's talking about the KFC's entry and storing down of the outlet in Bangalore. So at McDonald's, we learned it extremely well. We picked up the lessons from KFC and what has got to be done. 
<laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> <laughs> the objective. No, no, yes. no, if she can no. never talk no. about the climate change. Yeah, something that is very important to the crisis is. So I think that was years ago. So uh, the most important part of any crisis lesson is to, of course, to learn from others' mistakes or never repeat that. So I think we were we mm -hmm. we spent a lot of time preparing to build the story, a credible story, so that far which farmers would buy, which politicians would buy. And they would not come back, come attacking us because they feel threatened by us. They would, they should see value coming to the country. So there's a lot of work that we did. So it was a crisis environment that we entered into with the brand. And when we opened, there was no crisis because we worked very hard. So that's where this whole thing about you know being better prepared, all that really came from. Okay, over to Deepak. Yeah. So one last point, uh, Gandhi. So learning from what happened to KFC, we at Pepsi way back in 1995 decided to have a full strategy what has happened to enron and what has happened to kfc and we started mass contact program with such leaders farmer leaders farming members of parliament we brought out so many different things and look uh, thank god what work we did there and now you know, when I look at the Pepsi uh, share price, $130, we, we say, wow, <laughs> some contribution from us. So the crisis is good, that means. Crisis is good for you. It wakes you up. It gets oh, you to do things. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So, Kyati's here. That's the last question. Yeah. Uh, Rajiv and Odit, if I can ask you to quickly talk about your face first case, crisis case study. Crisis that client. Was my first crisis, I was working with a firm. Uh, I cannot name the firm and I cannot name the client, but that was that was really really bad. You know, uh, you know, I was talking. You know, Aman was talking about you know healthcare, and we were working with Haryana's biggest hospital uh, locally, uh, which have a lot of hospitals in tier two and tier three cities. In one of the centers, the dead bodies exchanged. And uh, we were we were we were called for, and that was a crisis. And that would you know, and we were we were. I was actually afraid because I was a young guy at that point. I was not aware how media will react to this. Everybody was standing there. Electronic media was all over the place. You know, uh, newspapers and everybody. And the president of the hospital was standing right there. And I was the only person who was there. And you know, then the entire strategy happened. You know, I spoke with the people and everything. But then. You know, one thing was sure that I, I, I said, you know, sorry, I'm not going to handle another crisis. But then, you know, when when the maturity happened, you know, you keep on meeting clients which have different, you know, crisis during the time. And I think um, uh, we we learned from that. Absolutely, thinking on your feet, and the first time one is the first one is always tough. Rajiv, yeah. your first crisis. I'll just take ten seconds. My first crisis were to was to handle the intergovernmental panel on climate change, India's report, and how the government reacted to it. And then wow. finally, almost a month's time, coming up with a productive report for India on climate change and achieving sustainability. Awesome! You know, it just uh, listening to all of this just makes you actually aware that. Everybody has to start somewhere, right? And crisis communication, I think, now is part and parcel of what we do. So with that, I'll bring this discussion to a close and hand it over to Kyati. Thank you, panelists, for the wonderful insights and our audience for staying with us for this conversation. I wish you had time. It was our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kyati. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.